Good morning. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. I, you know, we've, we've all got cabin fever because we were shut in for like 12 hours there. It was rough. So we get to see each other again, get a chat. I love it. So, um, you don't want to drive in this part of Texas when it's snowy because it's full of people from Texas. You don't know how to drive in that stuff, right? So come on in. Glad to see the smiling faces. Um, just as a quick announcement before we get praying, um, we'll be having lunch at our place today, so come on out. And uh, we'll hopefully have enough seating for the adults and the children can, um, you know, utilize their creativity and finding a place to sit. Because children are creative. So as we start this morning, let's ask the Lord to bless this place, to put his hand of protection upon the place spiritually, and let's, let's pray that he's just going to show us more of who he is, because you, know, we're, you can never, you never run out of learning things about God. How can the finite exhaust the infinite? It's impossible. You learn a million things about God a day your whole life and just be scratching the surface after a lifetime of a hundred years. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, do this, God. For those of us who know you well, show us something new. There's never any end of the new. We, we can never exhaust uh, the infinite. And for, and for those of us who are understanding more of who you are and, and it's kind of new, God, also show us something new. Show us more of who you are today through our worship as we're singing to you um, and as we're looking at your word, Father. Help us understand a bit more. Um, help us understand this time as um, being kind of thirsty and wanting to be filled and, uh, and God we pray that tomorrow Tuesday, Wednesday that we're also going to show up to our time with you thirsty and ready to be filled so we, I just pray that each of us could get better at our prayer time individually with you and uh, spending time in the scriptures and that these habits could, could uh, build the discipline which have built freedom. So Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, your spirit would be upon us in a special way this morning. God, we pray that uh, your hand of protection would be upon this congregation spiritually, Father, too. Uh, we know that whenever you're moving, that the enemy's also moving, too. And we pray that you would just uh, have a bubble around us here uh, for this time that we're meeting, God. We thank you that you're the one that is the overcomer. And then, um, of course, for the universe, of course, for our earth, but also for us individually in our lives. And, and we thank you for that. And so, God, we, we pray that you'd come. Come and show us who you are. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you guys would, go ahead and move in this way and find a seat. And uh, we're going to start off this morning with a song that we actually learned for the first time last week called House of the Lord. So if you guys would, stand and praise with us today. And I know, I know Justin's excited, so let's get started. Here we go.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. body bowed and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance by heavy stone Messiah still and The son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord.
pray that the church of God this morning, Lord, may be able to understand truly what is the heights, the length, the width, and the depth of your love for us. Lord, to understand we've been bought with a price. Oh, Lord, we desire to glorify you in these bodies, to be so fully and surrendered and complete in our devotion to you. Lord, I pray that you would raise up saints with zealous hearts for you. Lord, that their desire is to know their God, to walk with you, to lay down all, that you might be lifted up higher. And may our may the call in our lives, may our hearts desire exactly what John the Baptist said, that we might decrease, and Lord, that you would increase. Or even like Paul would say that I'm dead. It's no longer me who lives. Christ, it's you who lives in us. In the life that we live now, we live by faith in your name. Fill your church, Spirit of God. Bring strength to us. Fill our hearts with wonder. And may in our worship this morning, in this last song that we go to, may we truly believe that it's just you that we want. Nothing else, no praise, no adulation of man, no self-exalting of our hearts, just you.
good to see faces that we haven't seen in a while. Why don't you greet those faces? And before you do, I want to remind you that in the, in the black pouches on the back of the seats, there's a connect card in there. And if you are new to us today, you've never filled one of those out, I'd love for you to fill that out just to the level of your comfort. There's a side on both sides. If you want somebody to contact you from the church, I'd love to reach out. And when you do fill that out, you can either hold on to it until the end of service or during the handshake period, there's a giving station right by the exit here. So just drop it off there. We love you guys. Love on one another. In the name of Jesus. You guys would go ahead and start making your way to your seats this morning. John, did we ever get online volume? Wow, the Lord is good. You would not even know how many technical issues that we had this morning. That was insane. Down to the last minute, 
And uh, I kept thinking we were done with them, but sure enough, we were not. But uh, thankful to be online and uh, to see all you guys today. What a joy it is to be here. And I'm excited about what the Lord has for us this morning. And um, real quick, before we get started in that, let me give you a, just a few announcements for the church. Number one, don't forget that we have Bible studies that meet on Tuesdays. We are just kind of getting ramped up in that. So if you've missed those, don't feel like you can't come in. I think we're going to be in week four of an about an 11-week Bible study. So the guys will be finishing up Second Peter this week. And then I think next week we may start First John or we may take one week further than that just to rediscuss everything in First Peter. But ladies have been in Esther now. Arrival time for that is 6.15, and we get kicked off at 6.30 and go until 7.30. Secondly, we have a teacher's meeting, a children's ministry meeting that's going to be coming up on the 26th of this month. So if you serve with the children here, um, Cindy's got some things she'd love to chat with you guys about and just to meet with you guys and fellowship with you. And please know that there is always room for more people in that ministry. Um, our goal for you guys is just, if we had four more people, I think it is, serving back there, then everybody would only have to serve once a month. So we would love to be able to do that. If you've never joined that team and it's been on your heart, let this be the nudge of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then finally, there's going to be a ladies' cheese party that's coming up over at the Wills house, and that's coming up February 26th, the same day, but it's going to be later in the day. So y'all can kind of close up the meeting and go hang out just a little bit more if you're with the children's ministry. So that's all I've got this morning. That, that felt like a lot, but let me pray for us and let's get started today. Oh Lord, you are so good and so, so wonderful to your people. And God, it's our, our desire now to turn our focus towards your word. There's power in your word, God. And Lord, for the people that are here this morning or the people that are listening online, it's my hope that as we unpack these verses, Lord, that they understand a little bit more of who they were and who they are, whose they were and whose they are. And Father, that it's through these things and the preaching of your word and spirit as you connect to those things, that Lord, I pray that the, that the fire that burns within the heart of your people might begin to rage even more. And Lord, that it would propel us to be a people that are zealous for good works, hungry to serve you, God. So Holy Spirit, if there is anything in my message today that you would have me not say, I ask that you would remove it. I ask that you would fill my mind with the words that you desire for your church to hear. So help me this morning, Lord, and help us to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of it. We lift this up to you, and we thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so going through the book of Ephesians still, and last week we actually closed out chapter 1, but we're still going through this series called Treasure in Christ, and I kind of wish I would have named it Treasure, comma, in Christ to really emphasize that because you and I are positionally in Christ, because we've been saved, because Christ is in us, the hope of glory... There is much, much treasure for us to understand in the power in which we walk in, the love that's been given to us, the grace that's in operation in our lives, the hope that we have in the future. And that has been what Paul has been trying to get across as we started this. And we've seen that positional statement in him or in Jesus or in Christ a number of times as we have went through just the first chapter. Now today as we go through it, we're only going to see it three times today. But again, it's going to, it's one of those things that when you hear it, it should instantly cause your, your spiritual antenna to go up and to pay attention. Now, just as a bit of a recap, this is a letter from Paul to, the, to a church that he had, he had founded in Ephesus. He was there for three years. Timothy was a pastor there for 33 years. The Apostle John fellowshiped there. This is a church that is rich. And it's one of the reasons why Paul is able to speak in such a deep level to them doctrinally. But don't forget that also that within this city is the Temple of Diana, which is one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It's the largest temple, so that there's a lot of people coming into this town. It's a battleground city that plants a lot of churches in Asia Minor, but there's a lot of demonic activity there as well. 
Now, the title of the sermon this morning is Alive in Him. And we're going to see three of the most popular verses within the New Testament. It's going to be right to the end of this as we go through verses 8 through 10. But we're going to break this down in three separate ways this morning. The first third of it, we're going to focus on who we once were and what the state of the world is now in. Number two, we're going to look at what God has done because of that and what has taken place in us. And then thirdly, we're going to see the methodology that God used in order to bring us to salvation. So my hope this morning is that when we see that statement that we are alive in him, that that be a true statement for the church of God. That we are truly alive in him by the power of his spirit. So, just to give you a little bit of a busted up analogy this morning of what I mean by alive in him. When I was a kid, um, my mom every once in a while would make this terrifying statement to me. Where she would say, I'm going to tell your father about this when he gets home. And she didn't say it that often because I was a blazingly good child. But... Um, as soon as I would hear those words, death would enter into me. All the life would suck out of me, and I would just, I would be wondering what the day was going to be like once my dad got home. And then if my dad came home, and he's very gracious, he's like, ah, you know, the fact that you broke all that wasn't that big of a deal. All of a sudden, life would come back into me. And this is kind of the sense, in a really shallow way, what we're going to be talking about today of we were once dead, but now we've been made alive. In what sense is that true? What is the Bible trying to show us in this, and what does it mean for us as the church? So let's go ahead and read through the first 10 verses, and then we'll circle back. And like I said, break this down into three separate sections today. So chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up to be raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in, Je in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we see who we once were, what God has done, and the methodology by which he's done that. So let's try to understand this and pick it apart a bit. Let's circle back to verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm going to be clearing my throat a lot this morning. And let's read through those again and then start looking at it piece by piece. So chapter 2, verse 1 again. And you were dead. You were dead. In the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So this first statement that we see where it says, and you were dead. What does the Bible mean when it talks about death? Now just a few weeks ago, we talked about what the Bible means when it talks about life. And what we said at that time was life is that which comes from God. We see it early on in, the, um, in, the, in Genesis when mankind is created, he's in the garden, he has access to the tree of life. This is the life of God that comes through us as we're connected to him. So if that's life, if life is what it means like to be plugged into God, just like Jesus said, like a dead tree branch that all of a sudden gets grafted into a tree and through that begins to bear fruit, begins to come alive, is no longer withered. 
This is the sense in which we see life. But what about death? Death would be the opposite. Death would be the branch broken off and all of a sudden no fruit appearing and death coming to us. This is a life that is alienated from the life of God. Now, when it says that we were dead, we were dead in something. It was sins and trespasses. So a trespass is whenever there's a line that's drawn and that we are not called to go over that line, yet we go over that line. It Maybe you've wandered around in the woods before and you've come upon a, a tree line or maybe a fence and you see that big orange sign that says trespassing and you know that if you go across it, bad things can happen. Like a dog may get you, a, a strange farmer may get you, who knows? But if you cross that line, bad things are going to happen. Now, the interesting thing is, you don't even have to know you're crossing that line to be trespassing. And this is where the state of mankind is. That we're stuck in a state of trespass, where there was a line that was drawn. And that line, and the sin that we're talking about this morning, is anything that has fallen short of the glory of God. But we have a problem in our nature. And this goes back all the way to Adam. And if we look at Adam and try to understand the way that this first took place in the garden, we see that Adam is walking with God. He has access into that sacred space before the Lord, walking with him in the cool of the morning, access to the tree of life. And the one trespass that he was given, one line that you don't cross, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he does. God had told him, in the day that you eat it, you will die. Now, does Adam die in the day that he eats it? Depends on how you look at it, right? He was separated from God, so in that sense, he was taken away from life, and he abided in death. He died spiritually that day in regards to the life that he had access to in God. Now, God did have grace upon him, right? He didn't instantly call him to an account. He didn't instantly put him to death, and he wasn't instantly separated for all eternity from God. God had grace upon Adam. We see that he covered him in the skins of the animal. But he didn't put him to death instantly, but he was in a state of death. And this is where we find mankind. This is where we find you previously, if you're in Christ. This is where we find the state of the entire world right now. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all sinned. So this sin nature that we have, this is something that is inherited to us through Adam. Every single person that is born upon the face of the earth, we're born with this nature because it's inherited to us from Adam. The way that uh, David says it in Psalm 51, 5, he says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So everybody that you will ever meet throughout your entire life, has either been here or they are here. A place of abiding death. And the, the interesting thing about this world is it's almost like a spider bite or something. Where all of a sudden the venom of this world has come in and it begins to deaden us. We start to see corruption in our flesh. Everybody you meet is in this state. Destined for an eternity apart from God. The world is in trouble. My hope is always that as the body of Christ, we would understand where we came from. We would understand the, the pain and the darkness and the difficulty in that place and understand that the world is stuck there. That apart from Christ, they will always dine on death. They won't know anything different. They won't know life in God. And the methodology that God has used in order to bring life to men, mankind is you. We were plan A. There is no plan B in this. And it's not just that we've inherited a sinful nature and that there's these desires that are within us that want to stay away from God. There's a second problem as well that we see in the next verse. He says, in which you once walked, Following the course of this world, in other words, the entire world is headed this direction. Following the prince of the power of the air, 
the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So there's a second problem here. Not just do we find a problem inherently within us, that there's this sin nature that's within us, and it's a life that's apart from God, but we also find that there's a tempter as well. Now, the way that the Bible presents this to us is that when sin enters into the world, all of a sudden, a fallen angelic realm begins to take dominion over this planet. And the entire world is stuck under this dominion, being led captive by Satan in order to do his will. Now, the way that we see it take place through the Bible is that in, there's a, uh, a hierarchy within the demonic realm. So we see that Satan has his guys over different territorial regions, and then under that, there are demons that are very prevalent. The interesting thing about that is we see in Daniel that it says there's a prince or a principality of Greece. There's a prince or a principality of um, Persia. And one thing that God did was within this darkness, he enters into this darkness in a, in a way of grace, and he grabs one man by the name of Abraham, and he draws him out from the world, and he puts a different prince over him. And Daniel tells us that it's the, the uh, archangel Michael. But the world that we live in is under this darkness, and a lot of times we have no idea, we don't even recognize the fact that we are being led along in the course of this world by Satan. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, Paul even says something even higher than this. He says, in their case, meaning the people who are blind, who don't see the brightness of the gospel, who are lost, who are dead in their trespasses and sins, says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, the will of Satan is always going to be the same. The will of Satan is to drag as many people as possible into eternal separation from God. And there is coming a point in the future when there is no opportunity for us to make that decision. When we close our eyes in death, that decision has been made, and that decision has been made for an eternity. That's a scary thought. Now, you've probably heard it said, you maybe heard it said by me before, that we exist in this kind of in-between place right now. And what I mean by that is in this life, you and I experience the difficulties of a world that has fallen. We experience the difficulties of these principalities, these powers, this demonic realm that is constantly trying to attack us or to get us off course. So we experience God, but we experience this difficulty as well. But the interesting thing is for the world, while they are following the course of this world and they are going after Satan... There are still the common graces of God on this planet that they get to enjoy. In other words, they experience love from time to time, joy from time to time. There's peace that they have from time to time. There's coming a moment when all that common grace is gone. And when mankind goes to an eternal separation from God, can you imagine? You, you, I'm probably speaking to the choir here when I say, We've all gone through time periods of darkness. We know what that's like. We know what it's like to have no hope. We know what it's like to have dark nights of the soul. To where it seems like only pain and difficulty are there. Can you imagine? And that's still within the common grace of God. Can you imagine being taken eternally away from God, alienated from his life completely to where there is zero love, zero peace, zero kindness. You only abide in death. There is nothing else. And this is hell. This is what we call the second death, eternally separated from Christ. This is a, a horrible thought. If you've personally gone through those times and they've been momentary for you, or maybe even you're going through them right now, Understand that a life apart from Christ, this is the only reality. And it's much worse than you've ever felt. It's much darker than you've ever seen. And the entire world is being sucked like a vacuum into this eternal separation from God. 
It's a scary thought. When we look at this again, note, I want you to notice one other thing that it says here. It says, you once walked in this way. I love the way that it gives victory here. For the children of Christ, for those who are God's children, what do we see? We once walked in this way. We once followed this path. But now all of a sudden, something has changed. Something different has come. We've understood the gospel of Christ. And now we're following, we're walking a different way. We talk about it a lot here that we need to understand that the call of Christ isn't just a call of profession. It is a call of repentance and changing course and following Christ. Notice what it says here. You once walked following the course of this world. You were following someone else. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, you're either following Christ or you're following Satan. Jesus said, there is no middle ground here. You're either with me and you're for me or you're against me. We're going one of two directions. We're going to follow Satan or we're going to follow Christ. And we really see this pick up in 1 John chapter 3. Is John is talking to the church and he's help, trying to help them understand that this is a way that you can examine and test yourself and see that those who practice righteousness are of God. Those who practice sin are of the devil. He is so strong in his language. If you just read through 1 John chapter 3, you're going to see this show up so often. He's going to say, the person who has the seed of Christ in him, he cannot continue to practice in sin. There is a transforming nature that comes within us by the Spirit. Now, to let you down from the fear of, oh my gosh, am I practicing sin or am I practicing righteousness here? We're going to do this imperfectly. There's going to be a transition state in your life, particularly when you first give your life to Christ. I was talking to guys in the Bible study just this last Tuesday, and we were talking about the different ways in which, uh, maybe it was a different discussion I had now that I think about it, but we were talking about the different ways that when we came to Christ, instantly something about us changed for most of us. For me, it was, uh, man, my, my language was absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> something that Christ instantly took. But there were other areas in my life that I had to go to war and I had to battle. And for some of us, it looks different what that initial grace does to us and what it might take away. Some, it may just simply be understanding where you've come, who you know, and now you're pressing against the flesh in so many ways. But we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to walk this thing perfectly. We're not going to walk it perfectly 30 to 40 years within our Christian walk. But we should see some transformation of the Spirit of God that we are no longer following the prince of the power of the air, that we are no longer following the course of this world. And how is it that Satan mainly gets us? Look next. It says, We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. You know how Satan blinds us to this and blinds us to the beauty of actually having life? Because think about it, we're, we're abiding in death, at least we were. And because of that, we might have experienced some good here or there, but we all were very well aware that those things that we walked in, they produced death within us, shame within us, it destroyed the relationships around us, and yet we still thought that those things were the good things. That we've said before, that's the definition of insanity, right? That we continue to drink from the same fountain and it continue to destroy our life and also the people with us. Isn't that wild? And what Satan does and the way that he blinds us is as soon as the gospel is heard, as soon as we hear that we are called to repent and to follow Christ, instantly what rises up within us is, well, that sounds like bondage. That sounds like we're slaves. That sounds like all of a sudden we've lost all freedom. The very things that we think we're free in are the very things that are bringing us into captivity. And the very place that we can go in order to finally experience true life, we think is chains and bondage. How easily he's deceived us. Let me read for you Romans 6, verse 16. It says, Do you not know... 
that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death. And this is exile from God fully, totally, always apart from him. You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you've become slaves of righteousness. And this is the call. Are we obedient from the heart? Is there a change that's taken place within us, a new desire for new things? And this is why it's so important to do what Mark said, even as we were going into worship today. The avenues and the paths in which God has given us and that we may partake of his grace, that we may have these new desires come upon us, our time in the word, our time with him in prayer, our time together coming in here. If we pull ourselves away from that, we will begin to see the flesh and the carnal nature begin to rise within us. We are never in a place of stasis. This is always a dynamic walk. And if we're going to see God come in, if we're going to see our lives transformed, if we're going to see peace in our homes, if we're going to see love for our spouses, for our children, and even love for our enemies, we can't do this alone. We can't do this apart from Him. We have to come to Christ. And understand that we're following one of two things. We're following Satan or we're following Christ. Now, I, I, don't wanna, I don't want us to think of death in this sense as because we're dead, that means there's absolutely zero kind of choices, for instance, that happen in that life. And what I mean by that is you don't see that everybody is going to be Stalin. Everybody's going to be Hitler. Everybody's going to be exceedingly wicked. There's a lot of atheists that I know that are more, this should never be, but are more moral than Christians that I know. Now, how does God limit that? If sin is exceedingly sinful, how is it that the world isn't like that? How is it that the world aren't all mass murderers? Well, God has given unto the sons of men certain things in order to limit that. What did he give to the nation of Israel? He gave them the law. The law was supposed to be a schoolmaster. It was supposed to be a guide. What else has he given? He's given conscience to men. To where shame comes in when we step over those lines of trespassing that we talked about. He's given the church to the world to be salt and light. To help stop the corruption that's in the world. So God has done things in those areas. And there are choices that they make. And some of them make good choices. But they're dead in the sense of this. They have been alienated from the life of God. They have no access to the tree of life. What happened when Adam left? The cherubim were set up there. Angels with the flaming sword. Guarding the way to the tree of life. And this is their state. This is the world in which we live in. Now, the Bible also talks about a lot the idea of not just death, but the idea of being in darkness as well. And I just want to mention this because I think this is a helpful verse for us when we try to consider what is death? What does it mean to be apart from God? What is the Bible speaking of when we can currently right now be in abiding in death? So the way he says it in Ephesians 4.18 is this. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. So there's a very close tie between not just death, but darkness as well. I want to read to you in Luke chapter 1, verse 76 through 79. And this is, gonna, this is a prophecy that comes from Zechariah. After uh, he finds out he has a son, the son is going to be John the Baptist. Listen to what he says. He says, And you, child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby, and get this, the sunrise 
shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. The idea is this, that remember when I was talking about just a minute ago, some of the ways in which God has limited sin, and part of that was the covenant that he gave to Israel and the law that he gave to be a schoolmaster and a guide for them. What does it say about the word? That it says it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. You think about being in spiritual darkness, exceedingly bleak spiritual darkness where you can't see. And then all of a sudden, what comes out of that is a lamp and a light, somebody to light the way. Now, the difference of when Christ came is the day dawned and the sunrise shone. All of a sudden, everything became illuminated in Christ. This is the way it says in Matthew 4, 16. It's talking about the people who lived in the regions of Galilee when Christ came. It says, And the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them, light has dawned. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, get this, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So to a world that was lost in darkness and in death, God has given the light of his Son to us in a hope, in attempt, that men might come out of that death and finally be able to have access to life. This is what the gospel has done. This is what Christ has done for us. He's opened up a way for us we no longer have to sit in the bleakness of darkness. We no longer have to follow the passions of our flesh. We're no longer taken captive by Satan to do his will. And that's the next verse. Verse 4, it starts off, but God. One of the most beautiful transitional statements you'll ever find. The world caught in darkness, sin, alienated from the life of God, following the passions of their flesh, their future, eternal separation from all that is good in God, but God. But God being rich in mercy. And how was he rich in mercy? What did this look like? It says, because of the great love with which he loved us. And this is a love that's not just spoken. It's not just, oh, well, I love you. This is a love that is demonstrated, and it's a love that's demonstrated in the greatest way imaginable, the complete giving of your life for someone else, and not just for someone else, but for someone who's your enemy. Jesus said in John 15, 13, that greater, man, greater love has no man than this, than to give his life for his friends. And this is what he's done. We've talked about it before, that the cross and the way that God has set this process up you think about the myriad of ways that God could have delivered mankind or whatever that plan would look like. And yet, despite all the different ways that he might have been able to do it, he's chosen this way. He had chose the cross. Why? I don't know that there's a greater picture you can give of actual demonstrated love than to set things up like this to where the only way that they would be saved is for you to come and be tortured to death and killed. And this is the path in which God's shown. This is what he chose. And what that means for us is this is a communication method to us to really accurately show us not what God's love seems to be, but what it's demonstrated as. And this provides the greatest picture for us as well as to what our lives should be also. So he says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. And here's the verse. He made us alive together with Christ. Life has entered into us. What was once dead and decaying under corruption and in the end, eternal separation, you've been made alive in Christ. even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen to what, how Paul puts this in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. For one, a person, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Paul, in looking at the world, says, ah, there might be some, 
one or two people that might die for a really good person. Like there might be somebody that would die for Mother Teresa, for example. One will scarcely die for a righteous person. And then he surmises, though, though perhaps for a good person, one might even dare to die. But then he shows us the heart of God. And here's that, that transitional statement again, but God shows his love for us that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. God showed his love for us in this. That while we hated him, that while we had no desire at all for him, while the nation of Israel began to mock and spit, the Romans crucified him and beat him, it's in that place that he still died. Why? Because the great love in which he loves you, the great love in which he loves me. Titus 1 verse 16 says, they profess to know God. Remember when we talked last week about what it means to know God. This is an experiential walk with them where we come to know him more and more. It says they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Why do I bring that verse up? God has shown to us the most perfect picture of what love is. And that he died for us. That while we were yet haters of God, Christ came. Christ died. Christ gave his life. He presents for us what the perfect picture of our life is growing into. Remember I said we wouldn't do this thing perfectly, right? That we're going to struggle. There's going to be difficulty. But the one thing that we should see generating in our hearts and changing over the course of time is do we have this kind of love? As love began to grow in us in such a way that we would be willing to lay down our life, not just for our kids, not just for our spouse, not just for our neighbor, what about our enemies? I fall short of that. I can't always say that, uh, that, if that if I had to make that choice today, that I would die for somebody who hated me. But I know that through the working of God's spirit that this is where I'll arrive at some point with ever increasing glory, the Bible says. That's not to say I don't have wonderfully good days. And that there's days that I'm just so enamored in my love for Christ and the grace that's working in me that I would gladly lay down my life for anyone. But this is a process that we're in. But what I want to make sure that we do is we understand the picture of what it is we're becoming so we can feast our eyes upon that. I've told you this analogy before. It's like getting the thousand piece puzzle. And that's kind of what our lives are, are like when we first come to Christ. Just thousands of pieces. And we're thinking, how on earth do we fit all this back together? What does the Bible say? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Jesus is like the picture on the front or the back of the box that you set up. And you're able to see that perfect picture and begin to put things together. And it's not as though we do this on our own. We know very well that it's God who's working in us to will and to act for his good pleasure. But there's a call on our lives, isn't there? Do you know for every single fruit of the Spirit that you see, when you go through them in Galatians... You can go through, I think it's Colossians chapter 3, and you can see in every single instance where it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love or peace or joy in Galatians, that he says, therefore, put on love. Therefore, show kindness one to another. We are commanded into the things that we say that we're grown, that the Bible says we're being grown into. So what is our call in that? Is to understand Christ's life. And it's not just about being in the word. It's not just about being in prayer. It's not just about fellowship one with another and worshiping Christ. Those are avenues into his grace, absolutely. But we are called to make every effort in our life as well. And that was the sermon from last week. I I don't want to rehash all that. If you missed last week, I certainly challenge you to go back and 
take a listen to that one because we tried to show the process behind what it means to abide in Christ, to know him, to love him, and to obey him in increasing measure and in how we do that. But this is why I bring up Titus 1.16. It's so easy to get to, in a, to a place where we just begin to profess that we know God. But our lives show something completely different. My hope this morning is that, there, that the Spirit of God works something so profoundly powerful in us to where we see Christ as so wonderful, so pure, so perfect, and we understand this is what we're called into, and that we begin to fight for this one with another, to mortify the deeds of the flesh and to bring glory to God. Oh, that the Spirit of God may generate that desire within His church. And then finally, in this last section of it, where he says, he made us alive together with Christ. In other words, we've been attached now to the vine. We are partakers of the divine nature. And this life should be ever increasing within us. He says this, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. And here is a statement that we've seen twice now. And this is the third time in Ephesians. He raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's that in Christ Jesus statement. What does that mean? What did it mean when it said that Christ was raised and seated at the right hand of God? That he was far above all principalities, powers, thrones, dominions. In other words, Hebrews tells us that for, for a moment, he was a little bit lower than the angels. He became like unto the sons of men. But then what happened at the resurrection? He's seated at the right hand of God, above every throne, above every power, above every ruler, above every authority. And what is this saying? You've been raised up with him. Because we are in the body of Christ, because we are his. This authority isn't something that we have because of who we are. This authority is something that we have because of whose we are. Because we are Christ's, authority has been given unto the church. And remember what it said last week, that he's given to the church, him, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I think that the children of God, sometimes it looks like we're begging for scraps and not understanding the power that we've been given. There's something transitionally that's changed within you because you are now his. We need not fear the darkness. We need not worry about these principalities, these powers. Something has happened within us to where we have been raised to see, be seated with Christ. I don't believe that that's saying that in some odd ethereal kind of way that we're presently located here, but somehow we're also in heaven. I don't think that that's what it's talking about. We're in heaven in this sense in that we're in Christ. We're in his body. But the statement here is to help us to understand that when it comes to the darkness that's in this world, the course that the world is following, when it comes to the fact that Satan, this powerful entity that we don't even understand his power, is taken captive the people of the world, it can do something within our hearts. We can begin to fear. We can, be, we can begin to fear to step into dark places and try to set the captive free. Maybe Hollywood has done some of this with uh, the way that they paint the enemy. But you know who should get scared when we step into those spaces? Not you. Not me. True light has come. True power has come when you step in there. Again, not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. If we will begin to understand who we are because of Christ, what he's called us to do, and the promises that he's made us when we faithfully and obediently follow, church, we would begin to see some dynamic things happen in our city. We would begin to see some dynamic things happen in the world. Why is it that it's so easy to train us? Think of it like a flea circus. It's a weird analogy all of a sudden. You have a uh, cover over the, the, uh, the glass, we'll say. Fleas jump up. They just continue to hit us. This is our life in the world. And all of a sudden, you've been set free in Christ. But we're still only, we've been trained by the enemy to just jump so high. 
the lid's been removed. Christ has called you. He's equipped you. He's empowered you. And he said, you're over everything that you're going to face. You are seated with him in the heavenlies. And Paul has already talked about his immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. He's going to go on to talk about the immeasurable greatness of his love towards us, the height, width, length, and depth. And what does he talk about here? Because the great love in which he loved us, he raised us up and seated him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable what? Riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Paul seems to be preaching or writing this letter rather from this place of not even being able to measure or understand all that God has done. And he's trying to wake the church up to get them to understand this. Remember, this is a city that is cloaked in darkness because of idol worship. Our city is also cloaked in darkness through sexual immorality, drug addiction. Oh, there's a great light that has been given to us and a power that has been given unto us. And the way Paul says in 2 Corinthians is this, and we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that the surpassing greatness doesn't belong to us, but it belongs to him. The way that we begin to see these things happen and operate is not just by trying to experience Christ for one hour inside of a room. Oh, let God's spirit fall. Let us experience the power of God here. Let us see beautiful and wonderful things happen when we gather. But this should be our life outside of here. This should be the things that we're seeing as we're trusting Christ and going in and setting the captive free. Now let's finally look at how he's done this. The methodology behind this, verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So, by God's grace, by a gift that has come from Him, you have been saved. Through faith, this is the methodology that God has called, that those who come to trust, to believe in Him, and to have a faith that follows, a faith that works, you've been saved. You have come to recognize the greatness of Christ. You've come to recognize that even though you've been inoculated from this world, even though you've been numbed by the sting of this world, all of a sudden, Christ has made you alive. All of a sudden, the anti-venom has come within you, and you've begun to heal. You begin to wake up, and it's through faith. He goes on to say, Grace, you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There's a couple of terms that I want you guys to be aware of. Um, and this is going to be something that I don't want to really expand on today. I'll, I'll kind of walk you into it a little bit, but it's one of those things that you're like, okay, I'll go study that a little bit on my own. And it's uh, the idea behind the definitions of synergism and monergism. Sounds really fancy, right? <laughs> well, all it simply is, is monergism is that all of the work of salvation has come by God, singly through God. Synergism is when all of a sudden something's added to that, like faith plus works synergistically work together in order for you to be saved. So the Protestant understanding of how we are saved is monergism. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed to us in Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. So, there is debate within Christian circles, though, as to whether or not faith is a work. Now, go and study this on your own, but I'll tell you what I think about this. I think that the Scripture consistently tells us that faith and works are two separate things. That faith isn't a work. And additionally with that, I would say this. When you look at this verse and it says, For grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. The question becomes, what's the this? What's this that's not your own doing? Is it faith? In, order, in other words, did God give me the faith in order to believe so it's even his faith? How does that play? How does that work? Well, again, there's, um, there's a lot of... 
I don't want to say contention, just debate within the body of Christ about that. How do I look at it? I think the this that's not your own doing is the, the entire process of salvation. This isn't your own doing. You didn't save yourself. Why do I say that? Because right after that, he says it's not of work. It's not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Let me give you a, a, a bit of an analogy. Imagine it this way. Particularly if you're Jewish and you're thinking that through the works of the law that you're saved. So the works of the law is you climbing this rope. And you're climbing and you're climbing and you're climbing. And you're hoping to reach to, to heaven and come before God. And then you hear the gospel of Christ. What faith is, is letting go of that rope. It, so faith doesn't become a work. Faith becomes the release of work. And trust in God. So I personally, there's, there's people within Christianity that would say, the way that I just define that would be defining faith as a work, and because of that, you're a synergist, not a monergist. I would say, no, I am 100% a monergist. I just simply believe that faith isn't a work, that faith is a release from work. Because biblically, we seem to see that all the time. Faith and works are contrasted. But again, that's one of those debates within Christianity that's a second, third, fourth tier issue. It's not gonna, it's not gonna affect your salvation, which one of those you believe. But what is important when you talk about synergism is if you think that faith and works combined together for salvation, how you nuance that is a bit scary. In other words, think of it like this. Here's the level in which God will let you into heaven. And once you get up to that level, whether it's, you know, be good for three years or make sure you follow one third of the law or whatever, and then you show in your faithfulness and your works, then God will let you in. That would be a synergistic model, a fallen model. Christ comes to us with the gospel and he says, you have to do nothing. Come follow me. And it's our faith and trust in him to follow him in which salvation comes. Now, these are challenging conversations sometimes, but if you want to go look it up, again, it's synergism and monergism, and it's based around this text and what the this is. This is not yourself. But let's read it again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And what do I think the gift of God is? I think it's justification. This is exactly what I think Romans 3.24 says. That our justification is a free gift that's been given to us. So it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, the question then becomes, is okay, there's no hoops I have to jump through. There's no amount of works that I have to do in order to be saved. It's simply trusting upon the finished work of Christ and what he's done. So does that mean, therefore, that because I've been allowed in, there is no works that are supposed to follow? And that's when we need to understand what has God called us to? Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. In other words, we are on the potter's wheel. He is shaping us. He is forming us. And he has given to us his will of what he wants us to do. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for something. What have you been created in Christ for? Good works. So our salvation is for good works. It's not by good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I find a lot of times I'm asked, and I'm not even sure why, um, this seems to be a lingering question in Christianity, where I'm asked a lot of times, Trin, what's God's will for my life? As though God has hidden his will and we really have to search really hard to try to find it. Now, I'm not trying to say that there's not specific things that God may call us to do that he walks us into over time that we may not have known at one point and then come to know later. For instance, plant a church in Cleburne. I, I didn't know that year one of my walk. Praise the Lord, I didn't. I'm, I'm thankful I didn't even know he was going to call me to preach. I had a speech impediment, and uh, man, talking in public was like the worst thing in the world to me. But his will is not hidden. At least in the sense that there are certain things that he's 100% called every one of us into. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says that his will for you is your sanctification. 
And what that means is, is a departure from sin and a practicing of righteousness. And it's in that process, as we continue to commit ourselves to it, that we see true transformation begin to take place in us. But sanctification and your growth and holiness to be more and more and more like Jesus, that is the will of God for your life. The will of God for your life is to know Christ, is to build your relationship with him. This, is some, this was what we saw last week, really the entire point behind the cross, reconciling all things to him. All things include you. And we are called to pursue a relationship with Christ, not just to profess his name and then walk away. We are called to know him. And that's the beauty of what actual life is. We're called to know him. We're called to pursue holiness in our life. And there's also a will that God has called us to that's somewhat external to us. This would be sharing the gospel, making disciples. That's a command that's been given to us. That is his will for your life. To be a part of a church body, this is something that God has called us to and not to forsake. To love one another, something that God has called us to. To come together to edify one another, something that God has called us to. Where are you at in regards to what you know the revealed will of God is for your life right now? And how do those look? And if you find yourself in a place where you're saying, Trent, just, and I don't know why, but I have zero desire to read the word. I have zero desire to pray. And even, the, even when I do desire it a little bit, it's just so hard for me. This is where consistency becomes huge and discipline becomes huge. Because even though those things might be difficult at first, or maybe even by God's grace, he may put those desires within you. Before long, all of a sudden, you're going to have the choice of whether or not you go back to those places. Discipline in the body of Christ is key. Why? Because it's in those avenues that we begin to partake of his grace. When strengthening comes within us, when the Spirit of God begins to turn within us and to bring desire to those things, and what you find in your life is an ever-increasing desire to do the things of God. And when that place comes, and you have been, just been drinking from the fountain of God, all of a sudden you find yourself in a place of saying, I want to lay down everything. Maybe even to the place where I might die for the person that hates me. But we will never get there if we do not trust Christ and understand that he has called us to himself. These things are his will. And if you're going to do good works in Christ, what did Jesus say? Apart from me, abiding in death, you can do nothing. Now, that's not to say we can't be moral. We talked about how atheists, they're moral. What can't we do? We can't partake of life and we can't bear true fruit for God. Because even in that space of, say, the atheist who can do some good things, almost all the time those things are motivated by selfish desire. They can be motivated by selfish desire in Christ. We see in the book of Philippians where he says that some preach Christ for selfish gain. How important it is, church, for you and I to become lovers of this book, to become lovers of of Christ to go to him and lovers of one another. This is the call for us. This is the only way that we're going to see the fullness of Christ operate in his body to see us reach people that are out there for him. Do I want to see? Yeah. Um, so one of the areas we see this is in the book of James where James goes so bold as to say that faith without works is a dead faith and that kind of faith cannot save a man. But yet when we look at Paul, it seems as though, man, he is so focused upon faith and grace. And it seems almost like James, which is Jesus' brother, by the way, like James and Paul are at fisticuffs and like battling over, is it all of faith or is it all of faith plus works? It's important to understand that these two men are not fighting one another. They are fighting different crowds. Paul is fighting the Judaizers that are coming along that are saying, you want to be in Christ, make sure you get circumcised. Make sure you worship on the right days. Make sure you eat the right foods. And he's saying it's worthless. All of that stuff 
It is of no value. It is faith alone in Christ alone. And then James comes along and he's battling a completely different audience. It's the audience that says, I have a profession of faith in the name of Christ and I don't need to do anything. And he's saying, oh no, true faith is going to generate a life of works, a life of love towards God. But did Paul teach this? Yeah. Let's look at uh, Acts 26, verse 19 through 20. This is when Paul is defending his ministry um, when the Jews are trying to bring charges against him. And he's before King Agrippa here. And he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the regions of Judea, and also to the Gentiles. What is it that he declared? That they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. So this is something that without question, all the New Testament writers taught. They're just facing different opposition. So what does that mean for us? With all of this that we just read through, one, that we were dead, that we've been made alive in Christ, and the way in which this has happened is by grace through faith. What does it mean for us? How do we apply this to our lives? What should it do? What should be the effect of all this for us? Number one, I think as we reflect upon what God has done and the love that he has shown us, that we should at the very least desire that love. That we should at very least see we were destined for an eternity apart from God in hell because of our sin because of the disobedience that was within us, because of the trespasses and sins in which we were lost. But Christ, even though we were his enemy, came. What that should do, I think, for us is to begin to desire that relationship with him. It should motivate us. Do you really believe that you were caught in trespass and sin? Do you really believe that you were dead apart from Christ? Do you really believe that unless Christ came, a torturous, eternal death was your future. Do you believe that? Do you believe that's where you were? If it is, you've been made alive. Christ has done what you couldn't. Christ has done what you didn't even have to work for. And he's given it to you as a free gift. I want to read Titus 2, verse 11 through 14, just to Try to push this point forward. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. That sounds familiar, right? And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify a people for his own possession. And this is my heart for us. His own possession who are zealous for good works. Do good works appear to you to be bondage? Like, why do I need to do that? Or are you passionately hungering to serve Christ? My prayer is that the Spirit of God would awaken that within us. That no matter where we find ourselves this morning, if we've trusted in Christ, yet we haven't pursued him, and we find ourselves dead, that the Spirit of God may come over us and put this burning, passionate zeal within us to lay down everything and chase him. And the crazy thing is, when you think about Adam and the cherubim being set up and the flaming sword, what has been opened up for you the chairman have departed and the sword has been laid down. And you have access to God. Access to life. Access to the King of kings and the glory of glories. The Lord of lords. Secondly, I want to be able to leave that fragrance of Christ wherever I go. Whether I find myself in a restaurant... Oh, I want the, uh, whoever, whoever the waiter or waitress is that's serving me there, I want to leave the fragrance of Christ for her. I want to be the nicest person that she ever met, particularly that day. But I'll take ever. I want to give that. Why? Because look at what Christ has done for me. Look at the kindness that he's shown to me. 
That's the best way that I can live his life amongst the people. How well do you love? Do you open doors for people? Do you smile? Do you show them love? This is a beautiful way to serve Christ throughout the day. I pray you do. When people meet us, they should experience something radically different than anyone else they see in the world. There should be a question that comes up with them of, what makes this guy tick? What makes this girl tick? How is it that they are filled with so much peace and I can just feel actual true love coming from them? And this opens up the opportunity for us to share Christ. The second thing that I want to look at also. We talked about the plan of God to come to us, right? Think about the holiness of God where he is. Jesus, who in the form of God, perfect, in perfect fellowship with the Father, perfect power, perfect omniscience, being in the perfect place, what does he choose to do? He steps down and becomes like one of us. Those who are enemies, those that spit in his face. He has crossed that great divide to come to you. Now, the difference between Trinity and Jesus, particularly when he came to me, is infinite. He is the perfect, sovereign, holy God. And he crossed the great divide to save a wretch like me. Now, the difference between me and Johnny down at the uh, diner or the difference between me and even maybe Solomon. It's not infinite. I'm much closer to them than I was to Christ, yet Christ crossed that divide to come to me. There is absolutely no one that you will ever meet that you shouldn't be able to do the same thing. That you would come, that you would love them enough to share the gospel with them. I want to challenge us this morning. I want to challenge us to be intentional here. To understand that this treasure that we have in these earthen vessels and this gospel in which we've been given, I want you to challenge yourself this morning. Share that gospel with somebody this week. I don't know what your week is like. I don't know if you're around people all that often. Maybe it requires calling somebody on the phone. But you have the greatest news that has ever been given of a God that loved us so much that even though we were going to spend an eternity away from him and didn't want him, he wanted us. Bring that message. And may we never be the ones that are hard on the people that wait on us and serve us, that leave messes wherever we go. Let's be like Christ as much as we possibly can. And let's pray that God opens up an opportunity for somebody that he's been working in their heart. I pray that at some point this week that you're walking around completely forgotten everything that I've said, completely forgotten that I've even said, let's try to do this this week. And all of a sudden you're in Walmart and you see somebody and the Spirit of God's like, here we go. And then you're like, no. I would love to hear some stories next week from you guys of committing yourself to talk to somebody about Christ. Romans 5.10, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Last thing I want to say is, there's a, we look at our lives now. Depending on where you are, I don't, I don't know the, the status of everyone in this room. I don't know the status of the people who are listening via Facebook right now. But you know your life if you abide in death. There's coming a second death that's going to seal that fate for all eternity. And even the little bit of goodness that you have now will be stripped away. And we never know when this day is coming. As my timer ticks down for when this sermon is supposed to end, I think, is this going to be the last time that I ever talk to you guys? Will this be the last message 
that I ever give? Will I stand before the Lord in glory and give an account for how I led the church? For whether or not I was obedient to his will? And it makes me want, it makes me want to stand up here for the rest of the day and talk to you guys and continue to talk and continue to talk about these things and continue to pray that the Spirit of God may fill you guys with a desire to actually want him and to go to him. But there is a second death that's coming. And if you are apart from Christ and that day comes for you today, then you will experience eternal separation from God in hell. That's not me being mean. That is me loving you the best I can love you to warn you of what's to come. If you've never given your life to Christ, what is being offered to you is what Christ called abundant life. That doesn't mean that everything's going to go well in your life. No, a lot of times it means that things might be more difficult in certain ways. But even in the darkness and in the difficulty of what we walk in, there's something glorious about walking in with Christ. And as we like to say in the men's group, your relationship with him gets gooder and gooder. He is wonderful. If you've never given your life to Christ, come drink from the fountain today and receive life. Let me pray for us. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you with grateful hearts, Lord, that even though we were dead in trespasses and sins, even though we were alienated from your life, you showed your mercy towards us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, you died for us. You were rich in mercy towards us. Now, God, you have given your son that we may live. And I pray for any heart in here this morning that has been running away from you, knowing that this way is true, knowing that you were there, but yet they've been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin and taken the lies of Satan to believe that the things that they're drinking and is producing death in them is actually good. Lord, I, might, I pray this morning that by your spirit you would open their eyes to see that there is a different way to, a way to go. There is a different cistern in which to drink, in which living water comes in. And the life that you've called us to have, that glorious, wonderful, and abundant life is made available through the cross of Christ. So if that's you this morning, I pray that you would reach out to God and say, I've been running from you. I've thought that the things of this world were better than the God that made this world. Lord, I can no longer hold on to that belief. And I've come to trust in your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. And I lay down my arms and surrender. Lord, and I choose to pick up the cross and to follow you. Father, for the person here this morning that would make that profession of faith, that they would profess that you are God and that you've been raised from the dead, that you are Lord. Lord, that right now, something radical would happen. Spirit of God, would you enter into that person right now and begin to impart life to them? Would all of a sudden the darkness of shame and past be removed and that they understand that they have now been made alive in you? Old things have passed away and behold, all things are new. We no longer have to drink from the things of this world that produce death. Fill them, Lord. Save them. And I pray that they would come and talk to somebody on the prayer team today about the new choice that they made and that we can talk to them about baptism. Lord, would you glorify yourself here with these people? And Spirit of God, for those of us who maybe haven't committed ourselves to chase after you and we feel like our heart is in a place of deadness, would you make it alive again? Spirit of God, would you reconnect us to the vine? And would life enter into your body once more? And Lord, would that passion and that zealousness for good works return to your church? And God, may we see a church body that rises up, that doesn't just love one another fervently. Oh God, that would be enough. But Lord, that you would perfect love in them in such a way to where we couldn't wait 
to get outside of these four walls and to go be the church that light may dawn on them and the sunrise would visit them and salvation would come. Lord, we are nothing without you. We need you. Particularly if we're going to bear fruit that remains. Fill us, God. We thank you. We worship you this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mark, if you want to come on up, lead us through communion. All right, still works. Got the microphone on the way up. So we're going to have our time of communion, and um, this is for everybody who follows Christ. So whether you follow him here or elsewhere, you are welcome to take part in the communion with us. And uh, go ahead and pass out the elements, folks. So let's reflect for a moment. Just right where you are. Just pray and ask God to um, bring things to your mind that you need to repent of and ask for forgiveness. So this is not a public time of repentance or anything like that, but just privately. You know, what are some uh, moments that your thoughts were not as loving as they should have been? Your words were not. Your actions were not. So if you're new to us, um, notice you got two cups, so the double stack and the uh, wafers in the bottom. So in the upper room, uh, just before Jesus was arrested and later crucified, uh, he took the bread and broke it. And he said, um, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you that you offer us freely to come before you and pray, to come before you and commune with you. Thank you for taking the initiative and also being the finisher, the author and finisher of our salvation as the scripture says. Thank you for bringing us in, God. Um, we pray that if there's anybody here that does not know you, or has not followed you, that they'll, they'll take those first steps today. And God, we, we pray that each of us can become better at being your ambassadors, at being your children. Uh, we could be better husbands and wives this week, better kids, better employees, better students, that we could reflect more of who you are. And uh, may the love of the Father and the 
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You're dismissed.